Thanks again, Matt. <clears throat> if you don't mind, I'd like to start by reading part of a letter that was written to uh, one of our groups in Ottawa last month by Mr. Matsui Kazumi, the mayor of Hiroshima, on the occasion of the 72nd annual commemoration of the victims of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He writes, quote, On August 6, 1945, a single atomic bomb was unleashed on Hiroshima. This absolute evil instantly seared the entire city, slaughtered children, the elderly, and many other innocent people. By the end of the year, 140,000 precious lives were taken. And we know that an additional 70,000 lives were taken by the second bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki three days later. Those who managed to survive suffered the after effects of radiation, encountered discrimination and prejudice, and still carried deep scars in their minds and bodies. 72 years later, 15,000 nuclear weapons remain in the world. Individually, much more destructive than those that inflicted tragedy in Japan, collectively, enough to destroy the Earth itself. Given this reality, we must take to heart the message of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Unify in passion and take further action in order to clear the path forward to a world free of that absolute evil, that ultimate inhumanity." End quote. Rabbit. Rabbit. Omer Kazumi is absolutely correct. Today, nine countries retain about 15,350 nuclear weapons, but many have multiple warheads, so the total is closer to 22,000. Between them, the United States and Russia have almost 93%, followed by China, the United Kingdom, France, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea. At least five other nations, NATO states, have nuclear weapons deployed on their territory. Germany, Belgium, Italy, the Netherlands, and I'm sorry to say, Turkey. Roughly 1,800 of the 15,000 plus weapons are on high alert status at any, any given time and can literally be launched within minutes. Many are deployed in submarines and aircraft that are close to potential target countries, increasing the risk of a preemptive first strike, something, by the way, that neither the United States nor Russia choose to rule out. And as horrible as the bombs were that were dropped in Japan, as indicated by Mayor Kazumi, they pale in comparison to the destructive power of modern thermonuclear weapons. One ton, a one kiloton detonation would be the equivalent of 1,000 tons of TNT. The atomic bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima was 15 kilotons. Russia, as early as the 1960s, developed and tested a nuclear weapon aptly called the Tsar Bomba, with a destructive force of 50,000 kilotons. That is more than 3,300 times the power of the bomb dropped in Hiroshima. It was tested over Novaya Zemlya and produced a mushroom cloud 65 kilometers high, roughly eight times the height of Mount Everest. So Mayor Kazumi actually understated the magnitude of the threat to humanity. It would take nowhere near the collective power of the world's global nuclear arsenal to destroy the Earth. Indeed, scientists have determined that an exchange involving just 1% of existing weapons, given the immediate blasts, radiation, and the nuclear winter that would fall as a result of the dust and debris blown into the atmosphere, could literally end life on Earth as we know it, if not completely. Notwithstanding great strides that were made in previous decades between the U.S. and former USSR that reduced the size of the global arsenal from a Cold War high of roughly 70,000 weapons, and despite a legal commitment contained in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1970 to pursue good faith efforts towards total nuclear disarmament, movement among nuclear armed states and their allies today is going in the wrong direction. The United States, as many of you know, has announced 
that it will spend up to a trillion US dollars to modernize its nuclear arsenal over the next 30 years. And President Trump recently spoke of expanding US nuclear capability even further. Russia and China, following the US lead, are expanding their nuclear capability both on land and at sea. France is adding new missiles to its submarines. The UK is replacing its Trident nuclear armed submarines. Israel is adapting its cruise missiles to be launched from submarines. India and North Korea, as you know, are developing new long range missiles. And Pakistan is threatening to develop so called tactical nuclear weapons to deploy most probably to Kashmir. And there is also talk of delegating launch authority to field commanders. Imagine that. Now, just last year, the NATO Secretary General warned that more than 30 nations have or are building ballistic missiles capable of carrying nuclear warheads. And there is already enough weapons-grade uranium and plutonium in the world to produce up to 200,000 nuclear weapons. Now, add to this very deadly mix the prospect of nuclear terrorism. Both Al-Qaeda and Daesh, ISIS, have declared their intention to acquire nuclear weapons, and unless something changes, they, or some other similar group, surely will, and will almost certainly use them. Also, experts have warned that cyber terrorists may soon be able to launch a virtual nuclear attack, that is, to create the illusion that a nuclear attack is underway in order to elicit a real-world response. It's been reported in the American press that from 2010 to 2014, the US Nuclear Security Administration was successfully hacked 19 times. Now, potential deliberate attacks aside, the world has experienced so many mere accidents and miscalculations that a former Australian foreign minister by the name of Gareth Evans, after in-depth review of each of these incidents, concluded that, quote, our good fortune in avoiding another nuclear catastrophe to date has not been the result of good management, but sheer dumb luck. Mm. Clearly, uh, given our current path, it is only a matter of time before there is another nuclear event. Uh, will it be the US scoring off with North Korea? Perhaps, I don't think that's likely. But increased tension certainly increases the risk of nuclear miscalculation or accident. Now for some positive developments. Since the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, millions of people throughout the world have sought full and complete nuclear disarmament. Indeed, this was the focus of the first UN resolution in 1946, and there have been many since. And there have been many major milestones along the way, uh, just to name a few. The Antarctic Treaty of 1959 prohibits any measures of a military nature in Antarctica. We have the Partial Test Ban Treaty of 1963. The aforementioned Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1970 that includes a legally binding obligation to pursue good faith measures toward nuclear disarmament, and a treaty, by the way, to which almost all nuclear armed states are party. We have the Seabed Treaty of 1971 that prevents deployment of nuclear weapons on the ocean floor. The Moon Treaty of 1979 that prohibits the placing of nuclear weapons on the moon. And most significantly, there have been established five nuclear weapons-free zones in Latin America and the Caribbean, the South Pacific, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and Africa. Now this involves already 115 nations and almost 40% of the world's population. But all of these, until recently, fell short of a global initiative to ban nuclear weapons, which Meta has already alluded to. Now, just before I get to the treaty, I'd like to tell you that a major diplomatic hurdle that had been in the way for decades was that the issue of nuclear disarmament had been relegated, indeed restricted, to discussion in the Conference on Disarmament. This is a UN-mandated body, but it is not open to all UN member states. In fact, it's a closed club of 65 states that operates on the basis of consensus decision-making which has been misinterpreted to mean that unanimous agreement must be achieved before anything moves forward. Uh, the CD has not been able to agree even on a program of work for
for more than 20 years, and it is, for all intents and purposes, a dead forum. Frustrated by the extreme lack of progress and the closed nature of deliberations in the CD, in 2013 and 2014, roughly two-thirds of the world's nations participated in three open international conferences held in Norway, Mexico, and Austria that studied the nature and magnitude of the humanitarian threat posed by nuclear weapons. And with each conference, concern deepened and momentum grew. And in 2015, states took the issue to the UN General Assembly that operates on democratic rules of procedure. It went to a vote, and the General Assembly, with an overwhelming majority, established an open-ended working group with the mandate to address concrete, effective legal measures, provisions, and norms to attain and maintain a nuclear weapons-free world. In August 2016, the working group adopted a report recommending that nuclear disarmament negotiations commence in 2017. And last fall, 71 years after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, two-thirds majority of the world states voted in favor and mandated the negotiation of a new international treaty that would, quote, legally prohibit nuclear weapons leading toward their total elimination. And negotiations were conducted in New York in March, June, and July of this year, concluding on July 7th, as Mena has said, with 122 of 124 participating states endorsing a historic and far-reaching text of what is formally called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Now, the Netherlands was the only NATO state to participate, all other NATO states boycotted the process, but in the end, it voted against uh, the resolution and Singapore abstained. Sorry, excuse me. Now, I'd like to give you a few of the highlights of this historic and legally binding treaty. Now, among other things, the treaty prohibits under any circumstances the development, production, testing, manufacture, acquisition, stockpiling, transfer, use or threat of use of nuclear weapons or other nuclear devices. It further prohibits assisting, encouraging, or inducing the activities mentioned, including the stationing, installation, or deployment of nuclear weapons on territory of or under the control of a state party to the treaty. Article 4 sets out general procedures for negotiations with nuclear armed states should any wish to become party to the treaty. Now, this will include a requirement for the immediate removal from operational status of any nuclear weapons and their irreversible time-bound elimination within a deadline and verified by a competent international authority that will be decided upon at the first meeting of states' parties. And that, by the way, will take place within a year after the treaty enters into force, and the treaty will enter into force 90 days after 50 states have ratified the instrument. Now, this will almost certainly be in the next year or two. It will happen quite quickly. The treaty also requires that states that have not already done so must enter into safeguards agreements with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Article 5 requires the introdu introduction of penal sanctions at the national level for the commission of prohibited acts. Article 6 obliges environmental remediation and assistance for victims of the use and testing of nuclear weapons. Now, in addition to the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, vast numbers of people have been affected by more than 2,000 nuclear weapons tests since 1945. Article 7 requires state, states in a position to do so to provide assistance to others who are in need to fulfill their treaty obligations. Article 12 requires all states parties to the treaty to actively encourage states not party to sign, ratify, accept, approve, or accede to the treaty with the ultimate goal of universal adherence by all states. And Article 16 stipulates that the articles of the treaty shall not be subject to reservations. That is, states' parties must accept the obligations as set out in the treaty in their entirety. 
Now, as Mike said, the treaty will open for signature in New York one week from today, uh, September 20th, uh, just in advance, I believe, of the high-level segment of the UN General Assembly. It is hoped by many that heads of state will be on hand to do the signing themselves, which will be tremendous um, illustration of the commitment of their, of their various countries. So, the way ahead. How do we get from two-thirds of the world's nations to universal support to the treaty? This is not going to be easy. A following are just a few thoughts on what could be done in Canada and other parts of the world if there is the political will. Now looking first to Canada, uh, again as, as, as Meta mentioned, uh, regrettably our current government, in fact our Prime Minister has said openly that Canada has no intention of signing this treaty. At the behest of the United States, our government and all other NATO states voted against even mandating the negotiations at the UN, referring to them as premature. Now this, 70, 72 years after the first ones were used, 47 years after states, including Canada, adopted a legal obligation to pursue total nuclear disarmament. It's also quite ironic that our first Prime Minister Trudeau gained great respect in Canada and around the world for his efforts to promote nuclear disarmament in the 1970s. Now in 2010, a motion was adopted unanimously by Canadian members of Parliament and Senators that, quote, encourages the Government of Canada to engage in negotiations for a nuclear weapons convention and to deploy a major worldwide Canadian diplomatic initiative in support of preventing nuclear proliferation and increasing the rate of nuclear disarmament. So, what's happened to that determination? Well, undoubtedly, <coughs> it is tempered somewhat by ongoing trade considerations with our neighbor to the south, by NATO solidarity, and to be fair, by a sincere, if in my view, and I think the view of many others, misguided view that nuclear weapons capability actually contributes to, rather than detracts from, international peace and security. Now imagine if our government saw things differently and became a champion for nuclear disarmament. Though this is open to debate, many believe that Canada could become such a champion while becoming party to the treaty and while still retaining membership and good standing within NATO. Now the Canadian network to abolish nuclear weapons claims, states, and I think quite correctly, that NATO's strategic concept is a policy and not a legal requirement, so there would be no legal impediment to Canada retaining membership in NATO while becoming party to the Prohibition Treaty. As a state party to this treaty, Canada could, and would indeed likely have to, renounce for itself the nuclear element of NATO's security doctrine, to encourage NATO as an alliance and its three nuclear armed member states in particular to forego the nuclear option, to urge NATO to engage non-NATO nuclear armed states on the issue, and to work concurrently with others to develop alternative measures to ensure common security, measures that actually do enhance security for all nations. Now, to this end, the Canadian Pugwash Group, which many of you know, which is part of an international nuclear disarmament network inspired by a joint manifesto written by Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell in 1955, has called on our government to host a high-level government civil society roundtable to explore the development of a comprehensive whole-of-government approach to sustainable peace and common security. And we know that the UN is planning to convene a high-level conference on nuclear disarmament in 2018. We need to ensure that Canada is present and prepared to challenge the status quo among nuclear armed states. But this will not happen unless we step up our efforts and make our voices heard. Now in this regard, I'd like to mention a, just some of the activities that I know are being planned in the very near future. On September 20th, uh, coinciding with the opening for signature of the Treaty of New York, as Meta has said, there will be a day of action across Canada, including a rally on Parliament Hill and a citizen signing ceremony where members of parliament and senators and indeed the general public will be invited to personally endorse the new treaty. Canadians for a Nuclear Weapons Convention, 
this is an organization comprised of 973 recipients of the Order of Canada are, and are inviting all of their members to endorse the treaty and to urge our government to become party to it. On September 21st and 22nd, a group of 78, an Ottawa-based uh, non-governmental organization, which I am a part, uh, will begin a two-day seminar and conference in Ottawa. And this year's topic is Getting to Nuclear Zero, Building Common Security for a Post-MAD, that is, Mutually Assured Destruction World. Also on the 21st, the Vancouver Island Peace and Disarmament Network, based in Victoria, will be holding an event calling on the Canadian government to sign the treaty. On the 24th and 25th, Canadian Voice of Women will be holding lobby days on Parliament Hill. Also on the 25th, the Canadian Network to Abolish Nuclear Weapons will hold its annual seminar in Ottawa entitled Energizing Action by Canada to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Well, among other speakers will be four former Canadian disarmament ambassadors uh, and the keynote address will be given by the Costa Rican ambassador who was president of the conference that negotiated the treaty, Ms. Uh, Elaine White Gomez. The CNANW is also collecting endorsements from organizations on a joint letter to government calling on Canada to sign the treaty. Ceasefire, uh, the public outreach arm of the Rito Institute, has posted an online petition on its website, ceasefire.ca, and will soon invite Canadians to sign a declaration of public conscience in support of the treaty. Ceasefire will also list all of the activities by groups across Canada to support the Day of Action on the 20th of September and in the days and indeed the months that follow. I look forward to hearing from some of you on other activities that are, are planned in Toronto and elsewhere if you know of any. Now, moving briefly from Canada, I've almost finished the, the opening presentation here, moving from Canada to the wild, wider world. Now, as mentioned, notwithstanding words in support of eventual nuclear disarmament, <coughs> The interest of NATO nuclear powers, and indeed other nuclear powers, would appear to be primarily, if not exclusively, on non-proliferation. Now that is ensuring that nobody else acquires nuclear weapons capability. Because when others possess them, it poses a global threat. When we have them, it guarantees national and international security. <laughs> now to be clear, and, and uh, the disarmament community has been accused of, of, of leading a process that will further destabilize the world, and they, they suggest that we are proposing unilateral NATO nuclear disarmament. That is not the case at all. No one is proposing NATO nuclear disarmament absent other nuclear armed states. Rather, we seek multilateral, concurrent nuclear disarmament with full transparency and measures to ensure compliance and maintain international stability and security before, during, and after nuclear disarmament takes place. Now it's notable that in the discussions in the General Assembly, India and Pakistan abstained rather than vote against disarmament negotiations, and that North Korea voted yes in favor. Now they did not participate, and after it was announced by NATO that they wouldn't participate, that doesn't come as a surprise. Now, whether or not uh, India and Pakistan's abstention and North Korea voting yes was just diplomatic posturing, no one knows for sure, but it is clear that as long as NATO clings to its nuclear weapons, others will as well, and indeed others will try to develop it. So, breaking the logjam will require concerted international action on a global and unprecedented scale. We can safely assume that the 122 countries that have already endorsed the text of the new treaty will ratify within the next few years, so a new legal prohibition on nuclear weapons will have been firmly established in international law. Now, although as mentioned, the legal provisions will apply only to states that become party to the treaty, this instrument will have established a new international norm that has implications for all. We know from our experience with landmines, cluster munitions, chemical and biological weapons that whether or not a state becomes party to a, to a treaty, to a ban, uh, if a new international norm is established, it does have tremendous power. Now, this will be, to use a cliche, a significant, significant paradigm shift 
with respect to the legal status and global attitude towards nuclear weapons. It should no longer be business as usual where states can retain their nuclear arsenals with impunity. So how might this play out in real terms? Well, the international community could offer significant inducements to states that give up nuclear weapons. On the punitive side, though not addressed directly in the treaty, states' parties could impose restrictions on transit over or through their territory to any carrier of a nuclear weapon. States' parties could impose restrictions on investment in enterprises that directly or indirectly contribute to the development, production, deployment, or use of nuclear weapons. States could, could impose sanctions of the type that have been used successfully on Iran. Indeed, given the magnitude of the threat posed by nuclear weapons, states could, and in my view should, begin to treat nuclear armed states as rogue states, ah, okay. employing a wide range of diplomatic, political, and economic tactics and strategies of the type and of the effectiveness that eventually brought an end to slavery, slavery colonialism, and to apartheid. We already have the strong support of current and past Secretaries General of the United Nations, Nobel laureates in many disciplines, including Desmond Tutu and Jody Williams of landline fame. We have the support of Pope Benedict. The Holy See has been very vocal on this. And the Dalai Lama. Many scientists who as much as anyone understand the nature of the threat. We have the support of parliamentarians. An organization called Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament has a membership of 700 parliamentarians in 75 countries. And given that 122 countries are about to sign on, I think we can expect more. We have the support of environmentalists around the world for obvious reasons. But we need to further enlist the support of heads of other major religions, current and past heads of state and government who have not yet declared support, royals and their equivalents in various countries, politicians of all stripes, humanitarians, philanthropists, business people. Richard Branson, I believe, is already engaged on the issue. Well, what up, Bill Gates? Or Elon Musk, who recently, along with Stephen Hawking, has warned strongly about the dangers of artificial intelligence. That may be our next major challenge or they may be happening concurrently, we hope not. We need to engage popular celebrities in various countries who can influence attitudes by a popular culture. We need to use social media and other means to reach millions if not billions of people around the world and to get them engaged. Now, you know, a sense of entitlement is usually regarded as a bad thing, except, of course, when entitlement is warranted. Humanity is entitled to live free from the threat of nuclear annihilation, to live free from the threat of extinction. Future generations, if indeed there are future generations, are entitled to come into a world free of radioactive contamination that is not experiencing a nuclear ice age. Imagine if this were the day after a nuclear event. Those who survive will wring their hands and ask, what could we have done what could I have done to prevent this from happening? We need to induce, impel, and if necessary, compel those who continue to hold the world nuclear hostage to their nuclear ambitions to stop now before it's too late. We need a little fire and fury of our own, and we need, in the, mayor, in the words of Mayor Kazumi, to unify in passion. Thank you. Bravo.